Um, so with that, I would like to now introduce Maria Odin of Rice University. I'm sorry, I can't do a full introduction to her, um, but she runs the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen at Rice University. Um, it happens that I am a graduate uh, back in 1987 of Rice University. And uh, I have been at the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen several times, mentoring students and judging um, some of the um, projects that, that were uh, that they produced there. It's kind of like a maker space on steroids. It's kind of a, a combination of a national laboratory and a maker space. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I'd like to apologize once again for the boo-boo with Eventbrite and uh, take it away, uh, Maria Odin. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, Otherwise, I will- Sound good right now. Okay, fantastic. Um, great, thank you so much. What, uh, uh, following Leif's talk, um, I, I have a lot to live up to. Uh, what I'm hoping to do today is talk about how we can empower students worldwide to design solutions to pressing healthcare challenges and some success stories in that. And I think this plays right into this idea of open source. So I hope that I can um, give you some examples and, and maybe motivate us to all believe in the power of universities and students to be part of the solution. I'm a professor of bioengineering here at Rice University, and I am one of the luckiest people in the world because I get to work with students like this, students who are engaged, who are interested, who come to campus telling me that they have a passion. And that passion might be global health like mine, or it might be any one of these other really important issues. And, but what these students tell me and what young people are telling me all the time is that they want to, to pursue a career where they can make a difference in their area of passion. So part of what I get to do as a faculty member is to encourage that. And when I think back to the time when I was trained as an engineer, um, to be honest, most of my courses involved uh, listening to a professor talk at the front of the room and give me problem sets that I would turn in weekly. And most of the time, the problem sets um, had answers, at least to the odd number of problems, at the back of the book. And the truth is that engineers do not, in, when they get into the workplace, they're not solving problems that already have the answer at the back of the book. And if they are, um, they're, they're really not worth what they're getting paid. And so what engineers really need to do is something well beyond this. And when I think about how do I learn, uh, when I was young, how did I learn how to cook? I learned how to cook by looking at a recipe, but just reading the recipe book wasn't enough. I had to go into the kitchen and cook. And so that's what we do um, here at Rice University at the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen. The concept is the same. We learn how to be an engineer by doing. Uh, next, there's a little slide or a little video clip. Um, there is no sound associated with this, uh, so I'm just gonna talk, but I just wanted to give you a little view of the inside of the design kitchen. What we have is equipment and tools and spare parts for teams to be able to tackle engineering design challenges. But at the core of this work is that we challenge students to solve real world problems. This isn't problems that I as a professor think up as my, in my office as an excellent exercise for biomedical engineers. What this is, is we go to the community, broader community, local or in the world or local industry, international industry, and we ask them what challenges would you like for us to tackle? And then we give those to our students. And I'll tell you that when we started, people didn't believe that our undergraduate students could solve, really solve these problems. So they basically uh, sort of said to me, well, okay, that's all right, just go find some real projects, but we don't actually believe that the students will make a difference. We believe they will learn, but we don't believe they will make a difference. And um, I'm here to tell you that they do and they can. Um, while I'm gonna talk most of the rest of the talk about global health related projects, I wanted to point out that at the Design Kitchen, students work on all kinds of projects. You can go to our website. There are about 1600 projects have been cataloged over the last decade. 
Um, here's a team of freshman students who designed and then built a tree house on our campus. This is a team that worked with a sustainability living project and they created a garbage disposal that would separate the, um, the uh, solid matter to be used for composting. So you would put um, your uh, refuse in the, in the sink, but then the solid matter would be saved um, and set aside for composting. So I'm gonna now move um, in a different direction and, and towards COVID in fact. And I, I just invite all of you to think back to March of 2020 in um, the United States. All of a sudden, we started seeing headlines like this critical supply shortages. There aren't enough ventilators to cope with the coronavirus. And I, um, I had been working in global health for a really long time. And I understood this from the global perspective. And I, um, I will say that I and, and my colleagues were really shocked to think that this headline wasn't necessarily about the area where I do a lot of my work, Africa, but it was about what might be happening in the United States. And it really was an eye opener to a lot of people who haven't worked in global health to think about not having access to equipment that is absolutely necessary for taking care of patients. Many people on this, um, on this Zoom uh, have worked in, the, in global health and, and really have understood this for a long time. But I think a lot of other people's eyes were opened um, because there was actually talk of um, shortages right here at home. And we saw graphs such as this one on the left where the dotted line shows the available at the top invasive ventilators or at the bottom non-invasive ventilating systems um, with the bar chart showing the estimated need. Um, and, and we were shocked by that. We also saw, saw um, articles like this that showed how few ventilators there are in many countries around the world. Um, the country I work in, uh, Malawi, I, you know, I can't see it on my slide. I think they said 17. Um, so basically one ventilator per um, million people. So uh, really, really quite shocking. So back in March of 2020, my university shut down. They sent students home and shut uh, activities on campus. People were at home in lockdown. But there were a couple of exceptions. Our university said, if you are doing a project that's focused on COVID, um, if you can come up with a safety plan, you can work um, on that. And so there were a couple of labs at our university that continued to work. Something interesting um, had happened to us, which was that we had a student design team the previous academic year. So they finished in May of 2019. And they worked under the direction of Dr. Rohit Malia, an emergency medicine physician, who brought a challenge to these students. And the challenge that he brought was that in emergency settings, if a ventilator wasn't available, sometimes doctors or even family members are manually ventilating patients with compressing a BDM, so com compressing one of uh, these systems that you see here, to provide breaths to patients in critical condition. And as we all know, patients are not in critical conditions for five minutes or even an hour. People were being asked to manually ventilate for very long periods of time. And it's quite difficult to do, it's exhausting, it's hard to do it at the right speed, it's um, at the right frequency and at the right volume. So this team had worked and created this project um, that you see a CAD drawing of here at the side. And when COVID hit, people were looking for solutions and they came upon this project. The team had done a fantastic job. They had a working prototype. It performed many of the functions needed, but it really had some significant technical challenges left, um, uh, specifically in being able to continually run for hours and hours on end without overheating, without putting too much strain on the motors. So the team at the Design Kitchen, including Dr. Malia, um, he took on this challenge and said, what are we gonna do about this? So 
On March 20th of that year, this team came together with permission of our university. And, and I look at this picture and I think, oh my goodness, we weren't wearing masks because of course, at that time, that was not the recommendation. Um, but this team of people, some students, some staff, some clinical volunteers from our community came together to develop what we call the Apollo BVM. And what that is, it's an automated um, bag BVM device um, to provide safe ventilation. And it could be useful for some COVID-19 patients, but it also could be useful for others on ventilators that could then release the ventilator to be used for COVID-19, the sicker COVID-19 patients. And um, this little video shows uh, a little bit of its function, but, but the user can set the tidal volumes and set the frequency and the IDE ratio um, of this device. And we got um, one of the proud moments was uh, getting a lot of advice from clinicians that use ventilation systems to make sure that the user interface was really simple and easy to use and familiar so that um, it wouldn't be uh, foreign to a doctor. So a couple of these doctors came to visit one day and, and they were able to walk up to the device and instantly get the right settings and turn it on and get it going. And so that really um, motivated us that we were, uh, we at least had the user interface uh, correct. And, and we were so grateful to all of the clinical collaborators that, that helped make sure um, of that for us. It was able to meet many of the goal specifications that we had for the system. I'm not gonna, uh, for time, go through each of them, but we were able to demonstrate that, that this device was able to do many, many things, not um, to the level of a complete ventilator, but perhaps as a bridge device. On day 12 of this effort, we open sourced the design for this device. This was a huge, huge effort. Of course, getting all of the open source materials together correctly, making sure that the instructions were good was a challenge, but also getting the legal team at my university to be willing to allow us to open source this device um, in this setting. And, and I think you know, universities are very, very worried about risk and, um, uh, and liability. And, and so I really appreciated that our university, uh, I, albeit with some push, um, was willing to, to allow us to open source this information. It includes a bill of materials, model files that you could 3D print and or laser cut um, and detailed instructions for assembly. We also included testing procedures and the validation results that we had with our system. Um, one of the challenge with open sourcing and, and they uh, touched on this a little bit, which was, um, which was, uh, the issue of quality once something is built, and that's that's a real um, a real challenge. And so we really wanted to encourage people to test their system. As of um, six or eight months ago, we had thirty three hundred people register to get the plans, so they would be able to download the plans from um, one hundred and nineteen countries. And one of the um, wonderful things was, especially in those early days, we were getting images of um, the devices that people had built uh, worldwide of this system. And it's an example of, in those early days, the, the real need um, and concern that people, people had capability of making things, but having access to designs that they could build um, and it uh, was really important. And it also showed us how they were capable um, to build these. Just in case you think everything we do at the Design Kitchen is serious, I just thought I would throw this in. Um, our students also have fun and are whimsical. Um, this is a set of students who designed a couch uh, that would move around and has a boom box on the back. Um, and and we also encourage that kind of fun making as well, because what the students don't realize is they learn probably as much by working on projects such as that um, as they learn in their courses. So I'm going to change tax just a little bit um, and move away from Houston, Texas. Um, 
while I love Houston, we know it's just such a small little part of the world. Um, and about, uh, I'm guessing it's not quite 15 years ago now, um, in my search with colleagues for real world design projects for our students to do at the design kitchen, I took a trip. I, I, the end of this arrow points to Malawi. Um, I also went to several other places in Africa. But um, in Malawi, we visited Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. And um, we went to the neonatal ward. And this is very similar to what we saw um, at, in that neonatal ward. And we met some amazing doctors and nurses, all of whom knew um, so much about the kind of care they wanted to deliver for these babies, but also the gaps they had in access to medical technologies to be able to provide that care. And we learned from them that in the first month of life, the biggest cause, the most common cause of death is respiratory distress syndrome that is caused often from prematurity. They also showed us this corner here where they had set up a makeshift CPAP system. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, there's a pump right here that they reversed, but it overheated a lot. So they put a fan on it and then they have the, um, the, the um, pump provides a flow of air that they put part of the tube down in this water bottle to provide pressurized air. And the bottom line was that the nurses said, the doctors will set this up, but this makes us nervous. It's hot, it sparks sometimes, and it wasn't a device that could be used um, effectively long-term or be scaled. So we brought that challenge back to our students. And the challenge was to develop a CPAP system that would be usable, but lower cost to be used in the settings such as at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. We brought it to this interdisciplinary team of students. And I will point out that this little shoebox here that you see is the device that they ended up making. And I will point out uh, this student right here, Jocelyn Brown, because she took on this project and moved it forward. But by the end of the semester, these students, or by the end of the year, the students had developed a device um, that provided the same pressures and flow of air as what was in the system at, across the street at Texas Children's Hospital here in Houston. So we had some really fantastic preliminary data that we were able to take um, to work on uh, getting some additional funding. Jocelyn took the device um, to several places in Africa and demonstrated it to the doctors and nurses. And um, what they told her were all of the reasons why this device needed to be improved and the things that were wrong with it except that at the same time they would say, but can we keep it so that we can use it because we have babies in the ward that need this system. And so we knew that the need was there and the desire was there for this device. We took um, preliminary results to USAID and were able to get some funding to be able to turn that plastic shoebox from Target into something that was a little bit more usable as a medical device, at least for testing. So you see that device right here. It really was exactly what the students had developed, um, but it looked a little bit better to do a clinical evaluation. And in that clinical evaluation, when the uh, CPAP results were compared to the standard of care, which was simply providing oxygen, for babies with respiratory distress syndrome, there was a 40% improvement in survival when babies were able to get CPAP. And with these results, we were able to get some funding to take this device and scale it much more widely in the country of Malawi. So the star in this map shows where we did the initial clinical trial, um, but we were then able to scale it to all of the government central and district hospitals in the country of Malawi. And in that process, we also turned the device into uh, something that is called Pumani, which means breathe restfully in Chichewa, which is the language in Malawi. And the development of this device was so much done in collaboration with the clinicians um, and technicians on site that it was really wonderful to be able to name the device um, to reflect that. The system got CE mark and has become a commercial product 
um, it's sold at a lower price point than pretty much every other um, bubble CPAP system on the market. Uh, that is that ha includes a, a physical blender, um, and it's been sold in at least 36 countries worldwide. I'm going to take us back to that first trip to Malawi, and on that trip, we also visited what is euphemistically known as the equipment graveyard. What I didn't say earlier when I visited the NICU, um, the neonatal ward in um, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, as a mom of premature babies who had gotten cared for um, at, in both Boston and in Houston, um, I, it was hard to see the lack of equipment available for those doctors to treat those babies. As an engineer, seeing this equipment graveyard also really hurt my heart. And I knew that there must be a better way than having donated equipment that ends up unused because it's broken or can't be repaired. And so we, when we first visited Malawi, we asked about engineering schools and were there engineering schools, did the clinicians work with engineers from these engineering schools to develop solutions to their challenges? And it was really interesting because the Polytechnic is exactly right next door to Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Um, however, there is a literal brick wall between the two institutions. So even getting from one to the other, you have to go out and around and it takes a much bigger um, effort than walking through a door that uh, in my opinion should be in this wall. But we started visiting and talking to the engineers at the Polytechnic and working together with the clinicians at the hospital and um, discussing opportunities to work together. So we were able to work with the Polytechnic to build an uh, outfit, I would say, a, a room as a design studio, very much like what we have at the design kitchen at Rice. And we worked with faculty to think about how can you embed real world problem solving in your courses. And so now this is a group of freshman students who are starting one of their first classes by developing solutions to challenges that they saw when they toured the hospital. So this was something quite new. This, the design studio is outfitted with uh, 3D printers and laser cutters, very much like the design kitchen in Houston. And in the years since, we've now worked with six different institutions in Africa, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, um, in Malawi, and in Ethiopia to build these design studios and to work with faculty and technicians at those sites to, to develop solu local solutions to real world problems. Uh, we also have done some exchange, uh, student exchanges where we um, bring some students from the African institutions to Rice and we send some Rice students to the African institutions and students in both places work together uh, on developing uh, solutions to real world challenges. So what happened during COVID? During COVID, just like at Rice, where our institution allowed us to work on uh, solutions having to do with COVID-19, what happened in Malawi and in Tanzania and in Nigeria was that um, PPEs, were really not available to purchase locally. They were being bought up and they were not able to get these in Malawi, for example. So the design studios went into action and built face shields, built hand washing stations, worked on creating ventilation systems or splitters. And um, now, uh, Interestingly, the governments and other organizations have gone to the design studios, have funded them to get raw supplies so that they can now um, uh, pr create solutions. So for example, these face shields, we may be up to almost 100,000 face shields delivered across the multiple countries. Students at the, facility, at the design studios have created uh, UV sanitation uh, or re-sterilization um, rooms at their local hospitals. And this spirit of solving local problems locally 
really has gotten recognized within their own countries. Uh, there has been media attention. Uh, the president of Malawi visited one of the design studios and proudly could say that we are developing local solutions to our local challenges, um, which is exactly the vision that we were hoping for. So I'm going to end by um, saying that uh, it's my firm belief uh, that when we challenge our students, we educate engineers and leaders. We grow them through these experiences of being challenged. And at the same time, we can have real impact and we can have that real impact worldwide. And in many ways as a faculty member, I have to remember that if I give the students the challenge, then I, if I back away and see what it is that they can do and support that in the best way possible, um, there is absolutely no limit uh, to what they can do. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, uh, the, what you've said is so exciting that I could take up all the time asking you questions, but I'm not allowed to do that. Maybe later we, we can talk about that. I do want to say a few things. So I want to thank your team for doing documentation of the bag squeezer that you made, because Often, I think one of the problems is university researchers are not rewarded for doing the documentation, which is necessary to turn something into a life-saving device. You're rewarded for writing a paper that gets published, but not for doing that, that kind of work. So I appreciate that the team did that. Um, I have heard from many people at the beginning of the pandemic, engineering teams, that they were worried about liability just from releasing a design. And that is just not legally possible in the United States. If you do not present a design as ready for treating patients, you have no liability. Otherwise, university professors who create all kinds of things would get sued every month, okay? But many people don't know that. Uh, so I think it, it's worth mentioning that I think the issues you've raised with repairability uh, and other things are just really the start of a conversation. We're not going to have time because we have to stay on track. I do want to, to give you some questions from the audience. Krishna Kant asked, how can we support an engineer slash maker who is trying to create an NPV, um, I think that's negative pressure ventilation, DIY ventilator from easily accessible materials. He already has a working prototype. And um, Maria, I'm going to have to ask you to go real fast so we can get to Marcel Joe on time here. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, enabling that engineer to create these materials, a sort of a instruction manual, I think would be a big help. Somebody um, we happen to have somebody on the team that was really, really good at that. And, um, you know, you mentioned, Rob, the importance of getting the design out there. I mean, if, if you're going to um, if you're going to create it and you really want it to be open source, you have to make it easy for people. OK, thank you. Here's from Christine Luke. Are there any resources available online that could help project teams or companies launch their devices as open source? How to write a bomb so it's clear and easy to understand, instruction manuals, et cetera? That's a big question, but go ahead, Marie. I, I'm not aware of online resources that instruct people how to do it. What we did was create materials and then have people come in who are cold, did not know how to make it, and see if they could follow the instructions. Okay, so I, I'd like to say that I think there are some resources, but one of the things I'd like to do out of this conference is to develop a culture of how to do that. And there is not a well-established practice on how to do that. There, there probably should be. And then finally, very quickly, uh, Noel, Reggie Nyken just says, Maria, great work in Africa. 